Good evening. Um, I'm very, very grateful for the privilege of being invited this evening, and I'm particularly grateful to the trustees of the Deo Gloria Trust for giving me the honor of delivering this year's lecture on evangelism. He doesn't know it, but uh, one of the people at the table said, oh, we had J. John speaking. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Reminds me of a time when I was first at um, uh, Liverpool Cathedral, and the Friends of Liverpool Cathedral, who are great fundraisers, invited the new dean, which was me, to address them. And we were, and the place was packed out. Uh, uh, quite a big room downstairs in the cathedral. And uh, in the notices beforehand, the secretary said, well, we're so glad that so many people have come today. Uh, our speaker next month is X, so of course we'll need a much larger room. <laughs> Nothing like being put in your place. I want to add my own warm welcome, well, a pretty chilly welcome, but uh, at least a strong welcome to the staff and friends of the London School of Theology and to uh, Ruwani Kanawadin, who I know has worked so hard to make this evening's events happen. I apologize for the cold in here. It's to protect the books, which being Anglicans, we believe clearly are much more important than people. <laughs> if you fall asleep, well, don't fall asleep. You'll never wake up. <laughs> On becoming Archbishop of Canterbury, as uh, was mentioned in that embarrassingly generous welcome, I hoped to support the five marks of mission of the Anglican Communion and the quinquennial goals of the Church of England over this phase of the Church's life by giving special priority to prayer and the renewal of religious life in community, so religious communities, reconciliation and evangelism. I suspected that at the time that the priority on evangelism and witness would produce the most mixed response. For some, there would be high fives and celebrations. For others, perhaps a look of horror and a response of here we go again, yet another Christian leader pushing a recruitment drive. The starting point for any treatment of evangelism must have nothing to do with any presumed evangelical tribalism and everything to do with the heart of the Christian faith. In Christ Jesus, the whole of humanity is offered the gift of life with God, overcoming and transforming all the mess that we call sin. All that we know of God in Christ, however partial, however much a tiny foretaste of what is to be revealed, has implications not just for me, but every single person on this planet. There are two foundational principles here, the centrality of the person and work of Jesus Christ and the universal offer of salvation through Christ. The history of the church being embedded in different cultures and languages reflects a story that makes a difference in time and place where history is interrupted by God's free gift to each one of us. I speak as someone who made a very clear decision to respond to God's free gift of salvation. I may be Archbishop of Canterbury now, but I've not always been into this world of Christian faith. On October the 12th, 1975, just before midnight, I prayed a prayer that changed my whole life. I remember saying to God, I don't know much, if anything, about you, but please come into my life and take charge. I knew I faced a fork in the road, a decision to go one way or another, and I knew that it had huge repercussions for me. I actually thought it would completely spoil my life. I discovered the opposite. I wasn't doing something that was merely about my personal comfort, certainly not, a kind of private spiritual lifestyle choice. This decision was about public truth. Words like justice, love, mercy, grace would take on new meaning and weight because of Jesus Christ. Following Jesus Christ would be the business of public truth. The famous Russian Orthodox scholar Vladimir Lossky has this lovely phrase, phrase, Jesus was the first fully human being. 
In Jesus, I had begun to see how I ought to be and how the world ought to be. Seeing the truth of who Christ is somehow connects us with the grain of the universe, even in the midst of continued failings and struggles. That first tentative prayer, but clear decision in 1975, following the witness of friends at university, their prayers, their listening to my burbling on, and the patient discussions we had late at night was a response to the transforming love of Christ, a gift offered, offered to us all of us. Now that I'm in that odd band of Christians in professional Christian ministry, or in my case, sort of semi-professional, I'm no less aware that the salvation offered to me in Christ is free, it's gift. I did not earn it, and I never could. As it says in Romans 6, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's not just life in the hereafter, but it's participation in God's kingdom life of justice, and peace on earth here and now. I didn't deserve any of it, but through all the ups and downs and at times the cost, it was the best decision I ever made. It's the best decision any human being could ever make. And it is exactly the same for everyone, clergy, archbishops, criminals, sometimes they overlap, anyone. <laughs> Sounds like good news, doesn't it? Well, this is where we get to the red meat of our lecture title. Is evangelism really good news for everyone, and especially for those of other faiths? I'm told that IT professionals have this acronym for what they regard as ideal system designs, WYSIWYG, W-Y-S-I, W-Y-G. What you see is what you get. It's a good lesson for the church. What you see is what you get. This good news is free, undeserved, a sheer gift from God available to all. As we know, as you know, as well as I do, the word evangelism from the Greek literally means good news. When we make our evangelism a product in a marketplace or an expression of cultural superiority, then we are falling short of the message given to us. In fact, we are blaspheming and denying it. Indeed, it is possible to embark upon evangelism in a way that denies and even contradicts the very one we proclaim. If it is free and undeserved, there is no place for coercion, for imperialistic ambition, for bait and switch techniques that buy people into the church. Those products and practices are decidedly bad news. We would do well to start with the words of 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an account of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. We need to be ready to speak and to share. This is hope for the world. But let that weakness be seasoned with respect and gentleness. And, and let our actions of love, compassion, respect, gentleness confirm this as good news, not bad news. It was Marshall McLuhan that came up with that truism the medium is the message. Our evangelism, our witness, needs to reflect the message of salvation in Christ, the generous universal gift. Otherwise, we are betraying the message entrusted to us. That our message calls us to certain standards is not lost on those of other faiths, because all too often for them, the church has been bad news. This is where I'd like to suggest several challenges as we think about the work of witness and evangelism in our current context of religious diversity. The first challenge I wish to make is one to our Christian ethics. In working out how then would, should we live, there are a whole host of situations that we face where we have no prescriptive guide of what to do. In Christian freedom, we are called to worship, to pray, to read the Bible, celebrate the Eucharist, be accountable to each other in church. Out of these repeated disciplines, we seek to live as Christ would have us live in the world. One key indicator of our ethical lives together as Christians comes from what has become known as the golden rule. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus exhorts his followers, in everything, do to others as you would have them do to you. For this is the law and the prophets. 
Have you ever been in a situation where someone has tried to persuade you of something without listening to anything you've said? Not caring about your own experiences? And what's more, spent most of the time belittling your views? I'd like to suggest that one of the most effective ways for Christians to learn about ethical evangelism is for us to experience what it is like to be witnessed to by someone of another faith in ways that don't seem to respect our integrity or our freedom. So we can then recognize, whereas Christians, we sometimes act in that way. If you haven't experienced this firsthand, then I would encourage you so, to some imaginative process of empathy that might shape the practice of our evangelism. In 2009, the Christian Muslim Forum agreed a text suggesting how both communities could share their faith with mutual respect and understanding. Islam is another tradition that believes it has universal application. And so Muslims are committed to their equivalent of evangelism, dawah. The guidelines for witness acknowledged in the, from the Christian Muslim Forum that we could freely hold contrasting claims with universal implication, but that putting ourselves in each other's shoes would help us to do this with genuine respect. As well as rejecting coercion and inducements, one of the guidelines asserts that we will speak of our faith without demeaning or ridiculing the faith of others. Let me just pause for a second. Because how often do we hear Christian proclamation about Islam that either through ignorance or deliberately demeans the faith of the other? That we seek to persuade people of the love of Christ by pointing their own deficiencies rather than the beauty and wonder of the life offered in Christ. This is a big statement, but it's based on the golden rule. Would I want to have a discussion about my Christian faith, faith, what is most precious to me about Jesus, if the other person spent their time ridiculing me? I would want to know that the other person were listening to me and taking me seriously. And if I would want that, then I should give that freedom to others. In the Anglican Church calendar, the nearest thing we have to a sort of calendar of saints, we remember Sadhu Sundar Singh. Many of you will, uh, will know of him, most of you probably. He was an Indian follower of Christ, living the itinerant life of a holy man at the beginning of the 20th century. Sundar Singh had known the transforming power of Christ Jesus and wanted to tell others about Jesus. He would tell stories that represented his understanding of the free gift. One such story that speaks to the, hearts of our ethic, to the heart of our ethics of evangelism is of a man in a dark house. This man can see only by the light of a candle. Sundar Singh says, do we quench the candle or do we open the doors and let the windows to let in the light of the sun? Let us never be guilty of demeaning the light that others have just to show them something of the light we know. Let's tell people about Jesus and witness to what he has done for us without feeling the need to presume to tell others of their inadequacy. This moves on to the second challenge, and that is to truly listen to the person of another faith in our witness. Another aspect of the medium is the message of what you see is what you get is the incarnational nature of Christian faith. God in Christ enters into the life of the world in time and place. God has entered irreversibly into the hopes and dreams of his creation. The salvation story is one shot through with dialogue. The word doesn't just speak, but listens. Here's where I want to share something of the gospel according to Pixar. In the film, The Incredibles, the villain, Syndrome, has Mr. Incredible, our erstwhile hero, trapped and begins to talk him through his motivations. Now you, you respect me because I'm a threat. That's the way it works. Turns out that there are lots of people, whole countries, that want respect and will pay through the nose to get it. How do you think I got rich, says Syndrome. 
I invented weapons, and now I have a weapon that only I can defeat, and when I unleash it, at this point, Mr. Incredible tries to escape, and then Syndrome says, you sly dog, you got me monologuing. <laughs> it's a humorous take on a commonplace convention in adventure films, where the villain shows off while the hero tries to keep him talking till he works out a way to escape the fix he's in. Let's be honest, how much of our evangelism is monologuing? Speaking irrelevantly to those who may as well not be there, and if they did get a word in edgeways, it would make no difference whatsoever to what we were saying anyway. Becky Pippert puts it well when she says that evangelism is not memorizing techniques to use on unsuspecting victims. Evangelism and dialogue are not opposites. Any credible witness requires us to be in dialogue with the other, to hear the hopes, fears, and experiences of the person of another faith, to empathize with them, to have compassion, to share in their grief, to rejoice in their joy, to celebrate their successes, and to mourn their failures. Any dialogue with the faith, with another faith, should involve us in witnessing to our hope in Christ, but doing so as in the old cliche, with both ears as well as one mouth. If we are truly listening to the person of another faith, then one of the things we're likely to hear is something of the legacy of colonialism and the Western church's complicity in that. It's something I know I need to be especially alive to as a white man of a certain age who happens to be an archbishop in the established Church of England. We've got form. It's another aspect of that requirement of empathy, to, of being able to listen to the painful stories. But the third challenge is the need to be conscious of our colonial history, how it has impacted other faiths in Britain today. How are British Christians heard when we talk of the claims of Christ when we talk to diaspora communities who have experienced abuse and exploitation by an empire that has seemed to hold the Christian story at the heart of its project. Remember our starting point of the good news of the free gift of salvation to us in Christ. Remember that this free gift is given to us undeserving, meaning that no one is entitled or better than someone else. The ideology underlying the British Empire was largely predicated on the racial superiority of the British. The church often, not always, by no mean always, particularly if I may say so, the non-Anglican mission societies, uh, the church often colluded with that racist view. And it was a thoroughly un-Christian world view. A number of my colleagues here at Lambeth Palace have recently come back from India. As part of that trip, they visited the site of the notorious Jalian Walabag massacre in Amritsar in 1919. Hundreds of Indians were killed by the British Army while publicly and peaceably gathering to celebrate a local festival. The machine gun magazines that were emptied on innocent men, women, and children have left indelible marks on the remains of buildings in the park, the site of the massacre, and more seriously on the consciousness of Indian Sikhs, Hindus, and Muslims. Whether we like it or not, this atrocity and so many others was perpetrated by Christians and done in the name of Christian society. It's not good news. It's not of God. It's not Christ-like. So how might our witness hear the concerns by people of other faiths that we might instead be embarking on another imperialistic and dehumanizing venture? A week or so ago, I heard a story in a country I know well. I won't say where it is of a Christian group that had gone into that country which has suffered terribly from war over many years and had sought quite consciously to divide the church there over views on a major issue that affects the people in the global north, but not so much in the global south. What do we make of doing that. Is that not neo-imperialism? Some time ago, I heard that in one African 
country. Another one. The local Christians in what is a largely mixed Christian Muslim area of the country discouraged a foreign Western Christian from coming to lead what that person described publicly as an evangelistic crusade. Crusade. The local Christians knew the sensitivities of the communal relations and how charged that word crusade was in the long history of Christian-Muslim relations. Against their advice, request, pleading, the crusade went ahead and hundreds were killed in subsequent riots. The errors and sins of the past are part and parcel of our present. And we have a responsibility to be attentive to how that past colors the interpretation of our witness. Let's remember, though, that the Christian message is not British and it is not white. It is for all. Therefore, and I stand here very aware of the strides that my own church needs to take in this matter, we need to be church communities that embody diversity. One of the evangelist tasks, ta evangelistic tasks for British people is to ensure that we point to a living, vibrant faith and one that does not reflect the cultural assumptions of nominal allegiance. In global terms, a typical Anglican Christian is an African woman, under the, just over the age of 30, living on under $4 a day. In Britain, our most dynamic and fastest growing churches are black-led churches with cultural roots that go back to Nigeria and Ghana. This gospel we proclaim is good news for everyone. I read some recent research which suggested that nearly half of millennials, those in their 20s and 30s, believe that it is wrong to share their faith with someone of a different faith in the hope that someday they will come to share their Christian faith. What is revealing about this research is that those millennials are happy to talk of the centrality of Jesus Christ and adhere to mainstream Orthodox belief. I believe that we need to take seriously the abuses of our history and engage other faiths with humility and empathy, because our mandate to witness will otherwise be disowned by a younger generation much more attuned to necessary demands for respect and cultural diversity. Part of an imperialistic approach to evangelism is a view that we come with our plenty to the benighted, suffering, living in darkness. My fourth challenge, and perhaps the one that those of us from the evangelical tradition find hardest is that of being prepared to learn from someone of another faith. When we listen to seriously to people of other faiths, we will find that many receive great solace from their tradition. We are not contradicting any of the claims we make about Jesus. To the whole of creation, our commitment to him as the source of all salvation, by recognizing that other traditions offer people encouragement, community, even deep wells of spirituality. But we may find our understanding challenged and enriched. This is another aspect of us needing to listen. Max Warren, a celebrated Anglican missionary scholar, put it like this. Our first task in approaching another people, another culture, another religion is to take off our shoes, for the place we are approaching is holy. Else we may find ourselves treading on people's dreams. More serious still, we may forget that God was here before our arrival. This is the essence of what we call the Missio Dei, the mission of God. God's mission of reconciliation goes before and beyond anything that we may see. Evangelism is not about dispensing bits of our God that we hold in our pockets. Whilst we can talk of the relationship we can have with God through Jesus, on one level of speaking, every single person is already the recipient of gifts of God, if only through creation. Paul makes this very clear in Romans. In that great hymn of praise to Christ, in the first chapter of the letter to the Colossians, we read this. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. All things have been created through him and for him. He is himself before all things, and in him all things hold together. St. Augustine said, God is closer to us than we are to ourselves. 
For those of Christian faith, other faith, and no faith, where does every act of love and justice and kindness come but from God in Christ? I hope that what I'm going to say now is not controversial. Well, I hope it is controversial, <laughs> but I hope you agree with it. <laughs> Did I write this? <laughs> some people outside the church are more like Jesus than some people in it. And many of us who are Christian leaders will have bitter and painful experience of that reality. May I just ask you to think for a moment, those of you who lead churches or bits of Christian work, even home groups, small groups, whatever it happens to be, where do you get the most savage criticism? The stuff that really gets under you and wakes you at three in the morning. Hmm. All that is good, true and beautiful comes from God. This should be no surprise nor embarrassment. And as Christians, we want to name the source of all that is good, true and beautiful is Christ Jesus. And to enable people to connect with that life-giving source and end of all our being, that they may be in covenant relationship with God. But it means that the encounter with someone who is not a Christian and indeed professes another faith altogether is still an encounter that can lead me into meeting Christ afresh, to receiving a gift of God from that other person. As I share the love of Christ with someone of another faith, witnessing to the transformation that he brings and that good, new and that good news that is freely available to all, what is in that other person that may reveal to me something of Christ that I don't yet know? Think of the story of the Good Samaritan. It is not a story of being nice to people not like you. It is the story of a person not like you showing you what godly neighbourless should be like. The person outside the fold of faith who reveals something of the love of God. Evangelism in this spirit that I'm outlining is not a triumphant march of arrogance, but a humble, generous journey of giving and receiving. I think of my friend, I'm privileged to call him a friend, Abdullah bin Bayer, Muslim scholar committed to nonviolence and to his cost to Muslim societies that accept Christians worshipping in full freedom. Heroic man. He's in his 80s. Meeting him has been an example to me. I do not hesitate to name his graciousness and spirituality as gifts from God. Every time I meet him, I come away thinking, I want to shine with the love of Jesus in the way that he shines with the love of God. This recognition does not stop me from affirming that Jesus Christ is the revelation of God with us and that a decision to follow him is the best decision anyone can make. But the recognition of my Muslim friend's love and grace as a gift of God, to me, has started a genuine friendship. In a recent book on interfaith relations, it talks of the need to balance persuasion with curiosity. This book agrees that evangelism should be on the table as part of transparent and honest exchanges between people of faith. The issue is not evangelism per, per se. We try to persuade or commend things to others all the time and in lots of different ways. The issue is whether we treat the other person seriously or not, and this is expressed in our level of curiosity. You know what it's like when you meet someone who's genuinely fascinated by you. And you think, why are they so interested? If we want to persuade someone that Jesus is the answer to all their hopes and longings, and yet we have no curiosity about their hopes and longings, nor how their religious tradition may even respond to those longings, then we are evidently not that interested in the other. How might our witness, sorry, lost the page there, you'll be glad to hear. It's all right, bad news, I found it again. Um, <clears throat> how might our witness persuade and be persuasive while also being genuinely curious about the other? This is not in the sense of finding the knockdown argument to defeat the other, but in seeking out what is significant, how they tick the uniqueness of their story. As Max Warren say, the worst error would be in forgetting that God was here before our arrival. 
Our Bible reminds us of a roll call of characters beyond the covenant household of God who became bearers of gifts even and grace to God's people, Rahab, Ruth, Cyrus, the Syrophoenician woman, Cornelius. If evangelicals remind the whole church of our mandate to witness to salvation in Christ, maybe my liberal brothers and sisters remind me that there are those beyond the church, including those of other faiths, who may end up showing me something of the love of God. This leads me to my final challenge. Treating people seriously and recognizing the image of God in the other and their eternal value to God means that we should never fall into the trap of evangelism as technique. It's about relationship, about love, not about building a power base. Evangelism isn't a tool of the church or about using God so that we can still be here in a generation or two. I used to say, you know, we need to remember that that, that, that every generation of Christians is the last generation unless we evangelize. I don't say it any longer because I realize how wrong I was. It was instrumentalizing the gospel. How do we express our love for others in witness so that they understand that we care for them even if they make no decision to follow Christ? Christians need to know that we can be smelt a mile off if our agenda is one that reaches out to others only if they are interested in becoming Christians. In our world today, people are crying out for unconditional love. To be accepted in community. The church should be the last place on earth that feels like you need a special passport or have to pass an entry requirement. What you see is what you get, should be our motto. So whoever you are, whatever language, culture, gender, age, ability, education, sexuality, job status, wealth, etc., then you're welcome to share in God's good gifts. What do you think we communicate when we cozy up to someone because they, we think they may come to the church social or the alpha course? They say no, and we suddenly drop the friendship. The message we relay is that they only have value to us if they're becoming Christians. That doesn't reflect the free gift of God to us in Christ made available to the whole world. Whether we're interested or not, near or far from God, God's initiative was freely made towards us. Overlay that kind of conditional friendship making with the cultural and religious histories of our nation, and you can see the potentially toxic mix for relations with other faiths. This is why so many religious groups rightly complain of being targeted by Christians. It's one thing to feel a calling to share your lives with a particular cultural people, it's another thing to see their value only as would-be Christians. Going back to those Christian Muslim communities in Africa that I mentioned, these were churches that were witnessing daily and shared lives as friends and neighbors. They would have to continue as friends and neighbors long after the foreign missionary finished the evangelistic crusade. Witnessing to the claims of Christ, sharing what we know of the salvation story, comes in the midst of everyday stuff where we are called to speak and where our deeds are meant to back up our words. It's for this reason the Church of England's program to resource our engagement with other faiths is called presence and engagement. These words were chosen deliberately to represent the full ways, range of ways in which we might connect with people of other faiths in our communities through neighborly service, dialogue, witness, and shared action for the common good. Some people are fond of quoting St. Francis saying, preach the gospel at all times, where necessary, use words. At the risk of being controversial and irritating again, I don't actually think St. Francis ever said this. <laughs> and I sort of think that if he did, he was wrong. And I'm not sure we should use this quotation as a get out to avoid verbal witness. We are called to preach the gospel with our words, to testify, to witness to what God has done in Christ. Words are not the last resort. However, words need to explain deeds and deeds to support our words. In a cathedral I know well, there's been extensive project work serving refugees from a largely Muslim faith background. It's a ministry involving advice and counseling, social contact, friendship, and hosting. It's the kind of ministry replicated up and down the country in many, many churches. It's been faithful, quiet, unassuming. And if the workers and volunteers in that place were honest with you, they'd admit to a level of discomfort around the world, word evangelism. It's not quite their tradition. 
again, let's remember the ethical challenge of not offering inducements with evangelism. Their story is not about inappropriate inducements, though, but shared lives of faith. One of the joys in Britain in becoming a much more multicultural and multi-faith country is that we're rubbing shoulders up against each other in profound ways and have the potential to offer mutual challenge and learning. Many other faith communities don't have the same queasiness around matters of faith that we sometimes do. Faith is not a forbidden topic of conversation to polite at, at the dinner table along with politics and sex. The unconditional love of God is not a privatized lifestyle choice. It is public truth. The cathedral workers and volunteers are beginning to learn to respond to the questions of refugees wanting to learn more about the Christian faith, giving an account of the hope that is within them. Intertwined in these conversations are stories of dreams and visions, prayerful searches, because the refugees are familiar with the supernatural and the significance of prayer. Somehow, in the providence of God, witnessing to Christ, offering good news that is genuinely good news, rebounds in a virtuous circle where we too may meet Christ afresh. Witnessing to the gift of Christ is an intrinsic part of our calling. However, faithful witness will lead us into and spring from friendship, partner and one, partnership and wonder, as well as the joys of others discovering Christ anew alongside those of other religious traditions. In many other places around the world, this is a path that is costly where the ultimate price is paid. The privilege of living in a free and mature democracy is that we can both be held accountable to what we do and what we profess, whilst enjoying the freedom to pray expectantly and to speak intentionally of what we know of the transforming love of Jesus. The challenges I have suggested are no guarantee that we will not face rejection or even opposition. But let us face rejection and opposition for being faithful not because we were unethical, monologuing, imperialistic, arrogant, or unloving. We are called to speak, to witness, to share. But the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of others will always be a mystery to us. That is why we need to witness in dialogue, in genuine humility. I heard of one parish priest, even this last week, who was preaching to his congregation, boosted unexpectedly in recent years by those and baptized and confirmed from other faith backgrounds. He challenged them with these words of Jesus in John 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you. The priest acknowledged that the very different routes his congregation had taken to get there, in some cases literally by boat and smuggled in lorries. He acknowledged that some had met a Christian who had given them a Bible back in their home country. Some had dreams and visions of Jesus or had been beguiled by stories of Jesus, even from within their own religious tradition. Still others had very mixed motives when they had began attending the church, enjoying the community and support the church offered, but ambivalent about Christian faith. At each of these stages, the priest said, God, by his Holy Spirit, was drawing them to himself, calling each of them. Our part in that story of God's reconciliation with humanity is one that means that evangelism is not about conquest or competition, still less about survival and saving the church, but it is about confident, yet humble witnessing to good news to all. Jesus Christ is good news. Let us be good news, not bad news, to those of other faiths. Thank you very much.